Carl Fechner, co-author of the Growing Deep and Strong series and a life coach. Now before I can explain what the Growing Deep and Strong series is about, I need to take a step backwards and explain some things that's happened in my life. And the 23rd of May 1990 was a day that changed my life forever. It was a day that my life would never be the same. It's a day that my mindsets were tipped upside down. That I viewed life from a different paradigm in a way so profound that I never thought would ever happen. It was a day that I discovered that the world has two spiritual kingdoms and one good and one evil. Now I need to take a step backwards in my life to, to, to explain uh, just where this and what took place this day is how it came about and why it came about. Basically I grew up in a rural background, uh, I'm a farmer's son, and we grew up in a non-religious background. Uh, you know, for us church, ch at, uh, a church was a place where you went to weddings and funerals and we joked about it. It was so I really never had any understanding of the spiritual realm or God or, you know, any of that other stuff that was there and just wasn't conscious of it. And I remember with my uh, dad one day when I'd left school and I was home um, on the farm and uh, we were talking to our neighbours over the fence and our neighbours were uh, Roman Catholic and, uh, and they were, I don't even know how the conversation became on about God or whatever but it did and I remember my dad saying to, uh, to my two, two neighbours, to the neighbours, um, well as long as my kids follow the Ten Commandments, I'll be happy. Well, that's fine, but someone has to teach you the Ten Commandments before you can really know what they are to follow. So I never thought any more about it. I just remember it impacted in my life and just, you know, just being conscious of hearing that. So in my late teens, as I got a license and, you know, you're discovering who you are and you're getting out and about and you've got your freedom with a license and stuff, we started getting out, getting out and about and around and um, you know it was the alcohol, the birds, so in those days for me it wasn't drugs and in a sense of illegal drugs, uh, it was just alcohol, cigarettes and that sort of thing and we were pretty heavy drinkers, we used to measure where we, where we went by how many cans it took us to get there, so if we were going for a trip to the city which was, um, uh, let me see, um, an hour and a half away, we would measure it by how many cans. It would take us half a dozen cans to get there. So that was our lifestyle. It's pretty heavy drinkers and, and strong followers of the women. And I remember one night some of my friends, uh, or one group of friends that I had were uh, Catholics, Roman Catholics, and uh, we were out drinking this night. It was quite late, or you know, late in the night or very early in the morning. And I remember one, one of them marking like it was about 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning and they look at their watch and go, good grief, I've got to go to Mass in an hour's time or an hour and a half. And I'm going like, are you guys for real or what? And so they trotted off and went to, went to church and, um, and uh, did all the things that they do at church and then came out, picked up the alcohol, picked up the swearing, picked up the birds, picked up the bad jokes, etc., and just kept going on in life as it was. And I thought, man, this is a bit strange. If there's this God person that they're doing, how can this be the case? Also, there was another circle of friends that I had who were Methodist and Presbyterian. And they were different. They, I could see that they were clean living, they didn't drink, they didn't swear, they uh, uh, weren't womanizers or anything like that. They were clean living people. But the interesting thing about it was with them is that these Methodist people and these Presbyterian people used to take shots at each other and they were the Methos and they were the Prezies and it was really quite divisive amongst them. And, and I was sort of looking at this stuff and going, man, I, this, just, you know, this is just doesn't make sense. And, you know, because I thought, you know, if there's a God, there's got to be one God and he's the same God for everybody. And so then in my own thought life, I'm starting to observe what's happening around the world. And in those days it was Idi Amin and Pol Pot and other, uh, you know, dictators that were just doing atrocious things to humanity. And then, of course, Hitler, what he did during World War II. So, I, so at the age of 20 thereabouts, I made a conscious decision that if there's this God, 
how can all this bad stuff happen? And then with what I saw with my friends, you know, the divisiveness and the hypocrisy with it, I thought, well, I don't need God. If that's God, I don't need God. So I decided, I made the decision, and just went on my own way and really dismissed God from that point of view. So for me then, it was a life of chasing career and getting ahead in life. Uh, I got married, and I joke about it, I run out of mates, so I got married and married uh, someone that was probably 10, 12 years younger than me. We had two kids. We ended up moving to Sydney and I entered the motor trade and I was driven. I was driven to be successful in the motor trade. And it was at the expense of my family. And I ended up uh, committing adultery, leaving my first wife and, and leaving my kids, of course. And I came back and, I, and that chapter of my life closed. I realized that the damage that I'd done with my first wife and the kids was, was, well, it was irreparable. And in being in such a suicidal state uh, and, of dep and depression, I realized that I needed to be back with family. And so I moved back to Gippsland, Victoria. So I moved in with my mum and it was in the, in the winter. And I can remember an incredible numbness over my life and a coldness and it wasn't necessarily just the cold of the winter it was a coldness that was just there and um, I was like a walking zombie and I went to a psychiatrist because I didn't need any of that God stuff that wasn't even on the radar I didn't need that stuff though I'd already decided that when I was 20. So I went to see a psychiatrist to get some help and uh, she put me on medication and uh, antidepressants and drugs and so that helped me to cope, and that's about all it did. So I went back and just got a job selling cars, didn't worry about management or any of the other stuff, and just gradually started to get on with life again. I met up with um, one of my childhood sweethearts, a girlfriend I had when I was young, and discovered that she still loved me, and I discovered that I loved her. So we ended up living together and, uh, and uh, got married and I can tell you we are very happily married to this day. And there's no use by date on this, on our marriage. So I started to rebuild my career and end up uh, starting my own little used car yard with a few cars and a few dollars. And that was in 86 and we made an incredible success. It was incredibly successful. So much so that in, in late December, or in late 89, we needed to expand our premises. So we expand, but right at the time when we expand was a time where in our country, inflation was running, like some money that was borrowed was at like 16 and 18%, it was just totally out of control. So the Prime Minister of the day decided that this had to be, had to stop, and put the brakes on it. Well, that was at a most vulnerable time for us, and we got caught right in the middle of this recession as we'd expanded. So instead of making a huge fortune in, in 1990, which I planned, we ended up getting caught in this and ended up getting bankrupted. And administrators, that was just horrible, administrators came into the business and took it over. Uh, I was already out of it and running a, a car yard for, for a friend. And uh, December, May, in May of 1990, it was winding down to being closed and on the 22nd of May 1990 it closed. So in May 1990 my sister-in-law gave Karen two books uh, by Frank Peretti. One called This Present Darkness and one called Piercing the Darkness. And Mary, my sister-in-law, said to Karen, my wife, Karen, do me a favour, if it's the last thing you do for me, read this book, This Present Darkness. So Karen read, and I didn't know any of this, so Karen read the, read the book and then she gives it to me. And she says, Carl, I want you to do me a favour, I want you to read this book, but get to page 50 before you decide to, either, to, before you decide to put it down. So, okay. But I had no idea what the book was about. So I started to read this book. Man, it took some working out. What are they on about in this book? It really took some working out. And by the time I got to page 35, I realized that what this book was about is about 
a spiritual realm as well as a natural realm, this realm that you see here, but the invisible one that's around us. And not only about the invisible realm and the visible one, but also in the spiritual realm or in the invisible realm or the spiritual realm, there is two kingdoms, two rulers and two, of two kingdoms. And one kingdom is good and one kingdom is evil. And they've got rulers over them. So as I journeyed through this book and saw how that spiritual realm of good and evil affected the invisible realm, the visible realm that we live in, I really was having profound thinking and changes in, my, in the way I thought or my world views or my whole viewpoints. And so, needless to say, this is what was in my mind when I'm walking in to, to walking through May and leading up to the 23rd of May. So on the 22nd of May, our car yard closes and our business closes and we're doomed to bankruptcy the whole lot. I lost everything, lost every worldly possession the whole lot. The house we were living in was only a matter of time that was going to go on. Nothing was left. We had everything on the line, so we had lost the lot. So, as I said earlier, I was in a caretaker looking after a yard for a friend managing his little yard, used car yard. And on the 23rd of May, I go off to work, and man, it's just like, there's no, no life ahead of me. You know, a few years earlier, I destroyed my marriage and, uh, and all that I had and started with nothing again. Here I am back at that same spot. I've still got my marriage intact. But in my business world, it is just wiped out. I've lost my capital. It's like, when am I ever going to restore this again? So there was just no hope into the future. So the 23rd of May came and Karen was sick. And so I went off to, uh, and stay, uh, was in bed, or, or stayed in bed. That was ill that day and stayed in bed. And I went off to work. And that day... I had the most amazing encounter that you could possibly imagine. As I said, one that changed my life forever. One that my, after, from that day forward, my life would never be the same. All my mindsets and belief were totally tipped upside down. I totally, from that day forward, viewed life from a different paradigm in a way that was so profound, I, I would have never thought possible. And as I said, I discovered that the world comprised in the world there was two spiritual kingdoms. But you'll have to watch the next video to see what took place on that day.